Roll for initiative. The Roll for Initiative podcast. Welcome back. We are back from a nice little break from Gen Con. This is issue number 58. I'm DM Vincent along with DM Nick. Nick, how are we this week? Good. I ain't going to Gen Con, though. (laughs) You're going next year. Don't worry. Yeah, I think so. I think next year might be the year I'm going to go back to Gen Con. Fear me. I will be back. (laughs) So we're back. Uh, Jason is busy tonight, so he was unfortunate. Just to, he told me to say hi to everyone out there. He was a little busy tonight with some things at work, so he couldn't join us for a recording. Mm. But we will uh, trudge on without him tonight and his spirits. Yes. So how was Gen Con overall? Overall, Gen Con was nice, except for the fact when I got sick a little bit. And <laughs> Oh, well, hey, you know, drank a little too much? No, actually, I ate some food in the convention center that wasn't good. <gasps> You actually food in the convention center? Well, I was desperate running between a game, and I was just like, oh, I have like a half hour. I'm like, let me grab a piece of pizza. Oh, no. Yeah. You know where they make that? Where? Well, it's made from the, you know, made from gelatinous cubes. <laughs> it's made from gelatinous cubes? Yeah. I did I did uh. not know that. Yes. By so- an Otiug named Vince. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're not an OT hug. So if you're listening to this podcast for the first time, wondering what the heck is going on, well, this is a podcast about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons First Edition. Our love. Ah, oh. we love it. That's right. We love it to death. Literally, mm-hmm. we will kill for. It. No, I'm kidding. Um. So yeah, at Gen Con we had a great time. Uh, I did see Jason. I did see Matt. Mm-hmm. Did get to sit down and speak with uh, quite a few people. It was kind of cool, Nick. To, when I walked up to a lot of vendor booths at Gen Con in the vendor hall or the exhibit mm-hmm. hall, as they call it, a lot of people were like, "Oh, I recognize your voice. Aren't you from that Roll for Initiative podcast?" I'm like, "Yes, aren't you, Vince? Mm-hmm. Yeah." It was kind of cool. Like gaming companies knew who I was by my voice. Yeah, I, I got the same thing too. When I was at Origins, I'm like, "Oh yeah, I've heard of you guys. I've, read, I've, I've I like listen to you guys before. You guys are great." You know. <laughs> So I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, like I was standing next to someone who did a demo. We were doing a demo for, um, it was called, uh, it was a slasher horror game or something, the D6 system. It, was kept, mm-hmm. it kept saying a Victims Wanted was the sign, and it was a, a horror game. I can't think of what the name of it was. I'm sorry about that. But one person in the game was like, we were playing the game, and he was just like, hey, I know you. You were you on uh, Save or Die. You are on Roll for Initiative. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> wow. It was kind of cool, though, but, you know, enough about that. Uh, I bought a little, quite a, wow, a lot of stuff. I got, uh, let's see, looking at some of the stuff I bought. I did buy, by Pirate, it was a Privateer Press or Pirateer Press. I got a Voltron's mini game. All right, Voltron. Yeah, nice. and I got I got the gold collectible. Uh, well, it's not really gold, but it's gold colored collectible uh, Voltron. Nice. Uh, I actually grabbed a whole bunch of stuff for Legend of the Five Rings. Okay. Uh, let's see. I got a bunch of stuff from TSR, like various modules, and uh, I got some dice. And I got actually, if you look at my blog, theevilgm.com, I actually found in one of the collections. Uh, I think it was my Villains of Vigilante box set that I got. Oh, nice Villains of Vigilantes. Great game. Oh, yeah. It was perfect condition in a box, and it was like 15 nice. bucks, and it had all the books, including some of, like, uh, I guess, adventure books, too. Someone threw in there as well. It came with an adventure, I believe. Oh, did it? I don't it remember. It did come with one, and if I remember correctly, when I got my box set. For all you who don't remember, Villains of Vigilantes, great game by Fantasy Games Unlimited. Yes. It's like, if you didn't want to get bogged down with all the minutia of playing champions, Villains of Vigilantes was your game. <laughs> it just, it, it seemed a little too packed in the box to be just the standard stuff. Hmm. And a little hidden gem that I found in it was a dice bag that had the TSR logo on it. Interesting. Yeah. I know that didn't come with the set, and I was like, all right, cool. Oh. <laughs> um, 
let's see. I got a whole lot of stuff. I can't remember half of the stuff. Was the swag bag pretty good this year? No, it was horrible. Really? We got a deck of magic cards. I guess it'll for a uh, promo deck that's coming out. It will be. Yeah, we got our usual, uh, was it Living Dungeon Token or whatever that thing is called? Yeah, yeah. We got Rifts, the MMORPG game. Really? Yeah, which I could care less about. I don't really have time to play online games. They gave it to you for free. Huh. People were, like, trading it away because they didn't care. Like, some old lady... It's the coolest game that nobody ever played. <laughs> well, it's an online game. No one wants them. Who cares? You gotta pay for oh, it. I remember the game Risk by Palladium. I have, like, 20 different books for that game. Never played it, though. <laughs> cool concept, but never played. So I remember I was sitting there by uh, one of the booths, and I was looking at my uh, my spoils, and some old lady comes up with like four versions, four copies of the game. And she's like, do you have any living dungeon tokens or whatever it's called? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I'll trade you these four games. for." <laughs> I was like, no, go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there were people obviously like scouring the floor, looking for people who left their bag out to get the magic cards. Wow. There really was nothing that great in the bag this year at all. Huh. No collector dice. Really? No. Uh, nope. Unless- no uh, die so you can get the commemorative die kit thing from uh, Crystal Cast? Nope. Oh, well. That's there, weird. There was a coupon to get a collective die from a booth, but it wasn't Crystal Cast. Yeah, because I know Crystal Cast, they make. I know at least for Origins, they make the uh, commemorative dice you know, sets every year, and you get the little six sider. Mm. No, we didn't and get anything. Get like, you get like 20% off or 10% off or something like that off the no. thing. Because that's the only time I ever buy dice is at Origins. I'll get the Camaro dice set. <laughs> and we got, uh, what was it, uh, a Lego comic book. Lego comic book? Yeah, because I guess the Lego uh, adventure games came out. Oh, yeah, I've seen those. Those Ooh. actually look kind of neat. I, my wife and I actually played the demo of the game. They actually had like a whole pit area you can go in and play. It was kind of fun, but if you're a little kid, it's good. If you're like our age and like role, well, playing. yeah, but they, you know that's their that's who they're aiming it towards. So it's a good gateway drug. <laughs> I, yeah, I, actually, I was thinking that I was like, if I had like a five year old, this would be perfect. Yeah, you know, if you have kids five to seven years old, that's probably you know that's what they're. Uh, that's what they're targeting their target audience is. And I think that's good, you know? Yeah, it was it was fun. You have one die and you have to like you can you roll it to see how many spaces you go. And if there's a monster, you roll the same dice and there's like it's like cut in half, like kind of in a way. Like part of it has dots and has a sword mark on it or has like a health mark on it or something, and depending on how you roll, that's what happens. Oh wow, okay. And there's four different characters on each set, and uh, they each have a special ability. If you roll the special ability on the dice, they can do it. Huh, cool. You, you can buy weapons, and you collect the gold, and the first person to get off the board through the gate wins. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. It took us maybe about mm, 10, 15 minutes to play it. Oh, that's cool. I mean, just perfect for the child who has the short attention span. It's Definitely. a good way to get him involved in a, an adventure game like that and maybe get his imagination going, you know? Uh, the one thing that pissed me off and my wife was the fact that, the, you know how they have the art galleries there? Mm-hmm. We went over and she, my wife actually found some artwork to buy from this one guy. It was really cool. And mm-hmm. the guy was just like, oh, you have to bring the, this to the register and pay for it and then come back and give it to me so you can get your art. So, like, What? He's like, yeah, that's how they want us to do it at Gen Con. So we're like, all right. So we went to go look for the register. We finally found the register. There was a long line. Uh huh. The guy was nothing but nasty on the line. Oh, really? The guy running the register? Yeah, the guy running the line for the register was nothing but nasty. And then my wife asked, well, why do I need to come over here? This is stupid. He's like, I don't have time to talk to you about it. So she, <laughs> so she snapped back, well, if you have time to take my money, you have time to tell me why I'm here. Change this tune real quick then. He said mm-hmm. because Gen Con has to get their ten percent. Wow, really? That's the only guaranteed way. Interesting. I told her just to go back there and just be like, "Listen, uh, I'll give you the cash right now," <laughs> and just so if the guy was asking five bucks, go like, "Listen, I'll give you seven bucks right now." Yeah, but no. Hmm. 
Yeah, and then I spent some time at the Cthulhu Tech booth. Oh, yeah? How was that? Fun. That's actually a cool game. Hmm. I don't know if you ever looked into it. It's kind of like uh, Lovecraftian Cthulhu with a mix of uh, Robotech and a mix of uh, anime. Yeah, I've I've seen stuff um, at the, like, when the, at Origins, they have, uh, Steve Jackson Games has, like, a booth. They have a whole bunch of Cthulhu stuff there, and I see, like, posters and stuff for the Cthulhu tech. Um, I I didn't really ever got into it, but it sounds intriguing. It's very, um, very dark, I'll tell you that. After reading the well, book, it's kind of dark. I mean... It's not for it's kids. Cthulhu. <laughs> it's it's not for kids. Like you can take Call of Cthulhu and play that with kids. You can. All right, maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could see playing with kids. Just don't let them read the book. And <laughs> but now this book is very dark and very like you know set in the future. And there's like this alien race taking over, and the, the humans and another race band together to fight against them. And they use mechs like in Robotech to fight and. There's these cults wow. and these hidden old gods and everything. It's really cool, actually. It sounds really interesting. I have to. I'm gonna have to check into that. That sounds sounds like a pretty cool concept. Yeah, the dice system is uh, you roll the the d10s, mm-hmm. and you can pick a combination of what you want. So you can either pick the highest roll, uh, like a, if you roll five, six, seven, you can pick the five, six, seven, and add together. It's kind of a weird system. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So, yeah, and then I went over to the Eclipse uh, RPG game booth, and I played there. That's another sci-fi game. Uh Uh-huh. That got really good ratings last year at Gen Con. Hmm. Spent some time there playing. That was a sci-fi game. Kind of reminded me of uh, Serenity or something. Oh, cool. Okay. And uh, that's pretty much Gen Con in a nutshell. Didn't get a chance to record a show because never can never can connect with Jason. We were all uh. busy. Either I was playing a game or he was playing a game or we were busy doing something with. He did tell me he did have a chance to sit down with uh, Peter Atkinson. Wow, really? And he had lunch with him uh, to talk about uh, gaming conventions. Huh? Yeah, because I I, when I met him, he's like, "Yeah, I just finished having lunch with uh, Peter." I'm like, "What? Really? Cool." <laughs> Yeah, he talked about uh, low tech con with him. Low tech, oh yes, retro con. Yes, retro con. <laughs> now he's gonna kill me. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was pretty much it. And I went to the D twenty radio uh, seminar, how to create a uh, uh, successful podcast, and made, got made fun of by them because they said I host too many shows. So <laughs> <laughs> seemed and, to be doing okay though, Vince. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got the D20 commemorative uh, Gen Con dice, though. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they were pretty cool D6 dice with the D20 radio logo. And that's really Gen Con. I mean, next year is like, they moved the dates up again. I don't know why. Oh, really? It's the, next year, it's the 16th through the um, 19th. Yeah. Well, that sounds like more of the traditional time. Mid, mid-August. Uh, but then... In 2013, they moved it up again. But then 2014, it goes back to the beginning. Mm. And it goes, what is it? It's got some weird dates, like the beginning of July. or No, no, the end of July, actually. Well, I know there's a lot of people that are really ticked off about origins changing their dates. Yeah, what did you say they were again? June? They're going to be... Well, they're normally... At the end of of June, but I guess for the next two or three years right now, it's going to be, instead of like at the end of June, it's going to be like more like the the middle of June, which is going to be a big hit on them in my opinion because uh, that's one, you know, a lot of families, their, their kids are still in school. Yeah. A lot of people will schedule, you know, who are gamers who have families, they schedule that time to go to Origins as kind of a, as a part of their summer vacation time. And plus you got kids, even if they are local, still want to go, but they're still in school. They can't go there the whole time. 
Guess where they're going now, Gen Con. <laughs> and they're going to be going to Gen Con. So uh, there's been a – I know there's a big peti- petition thing going on Facebook to try to get it changed. Well, yeah, I, heard I know quite- a lot of teachers are mad about it because one of the things they do cater to uh, – uh, people they do cater to are teachers. They, uh, there's like a special origins hall pass for any sort of teaching, and that you pretty much get in the convention for for free. Yeah, they do the same thing for military too. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's I don't understand why they're changing the dates. I think someone said it had to do with if they move it a little bit earlier, that the convention hall is cheaper to rent. Because it's not during the official convention season of the summer. Wow. So. Well, I know a lot of vendors were saying heard. that they're not going to be going to Gen Con next year. I would do uh, the Origins next year because of the low attendance. Yeah, attendance was probably just as low as in the past two years has been pretty low. I I'd know, say it was about yeah. the same as last year. I know the folks that I was sitting at with uh, in Cthulhu Tech, uh, the Wildfire, that the name of the game company is, the guy was questioning whether he was going to go to Origins or not next year, dude, because it was so low, the attendance, he said. So, yeah, that, okay. that was pretty much, yeah. uh, you know, all we can really say about that. Mm. Attendance is down. People were deciding not to go. So, yeah. we'll see what happens. Hopefully things will get better. You know, it's 2012 coming up, you know, enter the world still to happen. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe it'll blow People up just might go to both of them. <laughs> go out with a bang. Boom. <laughs> so tell me, Nick, how many stars do we have this week? We have, uh, we got two new stars up on iTunes. Yeah. One that came from, let's see. I'll I'll read this one first because the other one needs a bit more of explanation. This is the most recent one by uh, Hell Viewer <laughs> and gave us five stars. Oh, thank you. And Hell Viewer says, love the show, dot, 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 pod fade? No, we're still here. <laughs> no, we're still here. Yeah, we're still here. Um, Just a little bit of a... You know, we had a bit of a break, something, you know, with like with Gen Con and things like that. So, you know, because we do this when we have our time because we do this because when we when we have the time. So we usually try to stay on schedule like once a week. So we do our best, but we're back. And uh, one before that by Galfridis. Give us three stars. He says, meh. <laughs> well, meh, meh to you. Meh. So he says, all at times interesting, but they are rarely prepared. Wow. The advice for playing an illusionist is bring lots of darts. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Pardon me. Bring lots of darts. That one was helpful. Of course it is. Saying the addition that must not be named got old very quickly and at times makes it unlistenable. They complain that later editions have too many rules, but spend a great deal of time trying to figure out how to do something that AD&D doesn't have rules for. I love first edition, but it has it had many problems. Pretending that it was perfect and later editions have nothing to offer is short-sighted. I'll keep listening, but I'll use the skip feature regularly. Well, Galfridus, or Freitas, mm. however I say it. Wah. Well, we don't pretend that it it was perfect. We know it has problems. We like it with warts and all. Yeah. And as far as later editions have nothing to offer, well, at least not for me. Not I for mean, me. And not for Vince. I mean, I played them. They're just not my cup of tea. I just think what first edition offered is perfect for what we have. I mean, this is what the podcast is about. This is the, the podcast is about first edition AD and D. Ta da! There you are. <laughs> so yeah, it just has, I don't, first edition just has just enough rules that we need to play and just enough leeway to make, uh, for us to make our calls in the game so so you know you know I don't understand why uh you know what what the you know what the criticism is to like you know first edition it's a first edition podcast first edition AD&D podcast so I, I kind of find that statement about, you know, 
you know, first edition had many problems, you know, other editions sorts. Uh, it's irrelevant <laughs> to the show. <laughs> so yeah, and we don't have to like the later editions at all. So meh. So meh. But thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for playing. But that's that's all the stars we had for week this week. And anybody else who wants to uh, comment, as you can understand, we read them all, no matter what. And we'll comment too because that's what we do. So get up there on iTunes, you know, download a few shows, and uh, drop us a line. Let us know what you think out there on iTunes land. Yeah. So let's yeah. head into uh, some sage advice and read some emails this week. Okay. Sage advice. Sage advice. Hey, it's Sage advice. Oh. We can sing this week. Jason's not here to write Sage. Stop that. I know. <laughs> uh, first email comes from Buck Backup. <laughs> he says, I can't believe I found an AD&D podcast. Well, there's two of them, three of them. <laughs> believe it. <laughs> I listen to a lot of talk radio, but now I only listen to your back issues and trying to catch up. Cool. Your cool, styles you. are so clever, even though Nick is annoying. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey! Your styles are so clever, and tips and discussions are so helpful to this old ad and DM. I've been DMing since high school with a few breaks for life. My latest group is a few college students and my own kids. One summer campaign is com- Our summer campaign is coming to a close, as I have quickly wrapped it up before they'll leave for next year at Hogwarts or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The rust, yeah, you're a wizard. No, anyway, the rust is shaking off thanks to you guys. I forgot all about stating player actions before initiative rolls. How exciting! I can't. <laughs> he, I can hear the groans even before I tell them. Thanks so much. I queue up the good work. Another loyal listener, DM Buck, DM since 1980. Wow. Thanks, DM Buck. Glad to hear that you're getting some new players into the fold. We always like that, especially as kids. Yeah, I know. Doing the same thing with my kids, too. The next one comes from Mark, who is also known as Mr. Robopto on the OSR.org gaming forums, where everybody should go for great talk and discussion. Domo origato, Mr. Robotto. Domo. <sighs> wow. He says, Nick, I'm curious to know. No. <laughs> I'm curious to learn how to run a Skype game. What's the difference between the help programs game table, which is easy for beginners to use. What are the best audio setups, headphones, tabletop mics, laptops? <laughs> how to avoid it's audio problems perfect. when they creep up? Uh, how many people are recommended? Do you need video? Maybe touch on recording, editing for podcasting. I'm starting to invite myself into a Skype game just to learn. I think it would be more popular if people thought it was easy. Well, a Skype game, a Skype game is very easy. You don't have to record it. There's no need to record a Skype game. You just get a bunch of your friends together on Skype or find some people online and get your Skype tags together and make a conference. Yeah. And then you just do a lot of talking and rolling dice, or you can find a roll a dice roller online that everybody could see. Yeah. You don't really even need game table. Yeah, I think the the the, the one time I played last year over Skype I think uh, I had my video camera. My friend Jeff had his. I was at home, and you know I couldn't get to the game that that Saturday for for some reason or another. And uh, yeah, we just did it that way. I was able able to see the show them the die rolls. They could see here their die rolls, you know, through the camera. So yeah, there's other ways to do it, like a die rolling program, like you said, that everybody could see. Whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, the, as far as microphones or headsets, you probably want to go get the standard Skype, uh, what is it called? Skype approved headsets. You don't want laptop mics or desktop mics because it's going to pick up background noise and a lot of just annoyance. The headsets that are Skype approved are just to pick up the ones in front of you. You don't need anything more. They're, they're about, I don't know, I think you can get them at Radio Shack for $30. Walmart, same price almost. Yeah. How to avoid audio problems when they creep up? Uh, mm, <laughs> uh, you just gonna have to wait until they go through because it just depends on Skype. Yes, audio problems over Skype. That they do sometimes happen. Did you just pour a bucket of water over your head? 
what was that? Yeah. No, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. How many people are recommended? Uh, I don't. You could probably play with two people for all it matters, as long as you're having yeah. fun. You could play with four to eight players, as the original uh, <laughs> box set said. Yeah, <laughs> I've played with less than that. Come on. Do I you know. need video? No, you don't need no. video if you don't really want it. I mean, I guess most people don't play with it. It slows down the the Skype. Yeah, a lot. it does slow it down a bit. Yes. Touch upon recording. Well, recording is a. Uh, there's a lot of Skype programs out there now. When we first started doing podcasts, and there weren't any. So you had to buy mixing boards, like professional DJ mixing boards, which I have with a with a uh, editing with a professional mic and everything, just to record the podcast. And I didn't bother with the programs which they have out there, but a lot of the programs sound like crap. So as far as editing a podcast, that just you have to learn with uh, trial and error process by using Odyssey or Audacity, however you want to pronounce Audacity, it. Audacity, yeah. I've heard people say Odyssey, so. Uh, I've I use what do I use? Um, some program I can't think what the name of it is offhand. Soundwave, no, oh, something no. like that, yeah. And I use that to edit uh, Save or Die. Matt uses, uh, I think he uses Audition, Adobe Audition, mm-hmm. to uh, edit uh, RFI. Okay. Uh, yeah, invite yourself into a game just to learn, and uh, it is. A really good way. I mean, ten years ago, you couldn't do this type of thing, and you had to do play by post or play by email. Ten years ago, now it's just you know, you just as long as you have a fast enough computer, or not even really, as long as you have a good internet connection, you could yeah. jump online Saturday night and be like, "Hey guys, let's play a game," and everybody sits down as their munchies and their soda, and they play a game. Yep, and you don't have to worry about the commute going home. Yeah, and you can sit there in your boxers and, you know, no one will know. Oh, I do that even at my regular game night. No. Or do I? I don't I know. Don't it depends. I want to know. <laughs> depends how late it is. Yeah, right. Uh, next email <laughs> comes from Mike. Moving right along. <laughs> yeah. I ran across a post in Make Scene, Make Scene Blog about 3D printing company. That makes custom dice. Just finished your podcast with a 10-foot pole about dice and thought you might want to check it out. This site is called Shapeways.com. Go to the Games tab and select Dice. They have 23 pages of custom dice. My favorite is the Thorn set at the top. So that'd be kind of cool if you want to make your own dice. Go there. Yeah. That sounds pretty tip. slick. I didn't have to check that out. Yeah, thanks for the tip. Yeah. Uh, someone asked if this is the RFI podcast email address. I said yes. DM Jerry writes in and says, what rules do you use for spell books? Specifically, how much is one? How big is one? How many spells on a page? How much is a page? Any special inks or papers needed? Are there such things as traveling spell books a la Unearthed Arcana? Where does one keep their main spell book while adventuring using the traveling book? You get the idea. Yes. <laughs> yes, um, that's the answer. Yes. Next email. <laughs> no, actually, I do have an answer for this. Dun, dun, um, dun. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Dramatic pause. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember that there was an article for Dragon Magazine about this. I believe that there was, but if you want to find something that you might want to port over in the first edition AD and D. There, if you could find it, uh, the Spell Slinger's Guide for Hackmaster Fourth Edition has rules in there all about spell books, uh, the different types, the traveling spell books, co- type of covers, type of paper, type of binding, dim- you know, weight, dimensions, number of pages, you know, special covers like made from dragon hide, who knows what. Um, there's like several good pages in that book, that Spell Slinger's Guide for Hackmaster Fourth Edition, that you can easily pour it over into First Edition and use those rules for that. Not a problem at all. So in First Edition AD and D itself, I've never really run into that sort of thing. Have you, Vince? I mean, 
no, maybe I think, you just kind of just wing it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we ran into one adventure when we all fell in the water, and the DM made a uh-huh. big deal about, oh, your spell books went, oh, we just kind of like, whatever. I don't really care. Obviously not the great DM Joe. No, no, no. But it sounds like he's looking for something to where maybe this is a a, a campaign setting where it's really leans towards the magic user classes and want to kind of get a better I, it's a little more detail into that sort of thing so that's where I would point to port over that spell slinger's guide from Hackmaster 4th edition to 1st edition it's not a problem well I remember the traveling spell book was supposed to be when they wanted to make sense out of well where's a magic user keep that big giant book mm-hmm. so yeah. I've always considered the spell book to be magical in a sense of that it was a small enough book that you can carry it in your backpack, and when you flip the page, it goes to another spell. It's kind of like a magical flip. Uh-huh. Like, it looks like it has pages in the book, but it really doesn't have pages in the book. You understand what oh, I mean? Wow. Oh, wow. And when you okay, flip the page, cool it's kind of like a magical it. page. It'll just... Another spell, another spell, another spell. Sweet. I've kind of used that, but I know the traveling spell book was meant for like them to try to make some sense out of what happens that they describe their spells that they travel with in this book and keep their main spell book at home or in a safe spot so they don't lose it because mm-hmm. supposedly if you lose the main spell book you can never cast a spell ever again in your life or something I don't know <sighs> know what I'm saying yeah I do but <laughs> so GM Jerry that's all we can really tell you yeah some advice for you that's why it's called sage advice Yes, take it with a sage of salt. Uh, <laughs> no, that was bad. Another one comes from James H. He says, I got a question. How do you assign ex- an experience point total to an item you invented magical or artifact-wise? I made a sword that has flame powers. Oh, I wasn't supposed to emphasize that. And other properties. And has a few drawbacks. I made it into a royal family heirloom. How do I put experience point- How do I put experience on this item? Your thoughts would be helpful. Well, there is no formula for this. No. That I know of. If I was going to wing it, uh, what leaps to mind is what, as far as its abilities, what it can do, does it most uh, mimic or is closest to in either the Unearth or Can or the player's hand or the DM's guide? as far as other items, um, at least to give you a guideline, to give you something, the, to, the, a template, if you will, to go by. Sounds like something comparable to a Flame Tongue plus one, which is, I believe, like 900 experience points. But you throw in the little bit of a a monkey wrench into it when it's a artifact kind of thing from what he sounds like. Is that right? It says it's kind of like an artifact. Maybe, yeah. Well, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, artifacts don't have experience points values. Because they're so rare. So, right, they're so rare. And that's, I, and he did say that there are drawbacks to it, so that tells me that, yes, it is an artifact. Because all the artifacts in the DM's Guide do have some sort of uh, baneful abilities they inflict upon the user, like uh, the person becomes... Uh, turns undead or something like that. I don't know. Well, there's an interesting way that I was thinking about before the show. Nick, you have your DM guide open there? Yeah, I sure do. All right, let's start. Let's let's see if we can break this down for for him. We'll, we'll just guess mm-hmm. on some of the things, okay? Okay, so he made a sword. Let's just say mm-hmm. the sword is at least a plus one because you need at least a plus one to have some magical properties on it to make it magical. Mm-hmm. A sword plus one, how many experience points is that? Well, that's 400. Okay. Now, the flame powers. We'll assume that when he says flame powers, that it lights up flaming when mm-hmm. upon a command word, maybe. Yep. And it would strike and burn like fire. Right. Or like maybe fireball. Mm-hmm. Similar to that. Well, right. how much is the spell? Uh, is burning hands? Burning Hands? Yeah. Is it Burning Hands? Yeah. Uh, what is that? A first level spell, right? Yeah. 
So it's 100 experience points per level, so that adds 100 onto it for the flaming power. Uh, he says okay. other he says other properties. Let's just add some other cool stuff onto it. Um, let's see, add the flame on. Um, I don't know. Let's, Nick, uh, yeah. Well, you know, we could go by the special abilities that you can get from swords right in the book that you can roll off that table. Yeah. Let's say, uh, and that's on page. Let's see. Now, page 166, for under unusual swords. Let's say it's got three primary abilities, and it can speak. So it's an intelligent weapon now? It's an intelligent weapon. Yikes. I would think something like this would have to be an intelligent weapon. Hmm. Well, we'll just say it speaks, got three primary abilities. It can, I don't know, detect magic? All right, yeah, detect magic. What? That's a first-level spell. There's another hundred dollars added. A hundred dollars, hundred experience point added. What are we up to? Six hundred, seven hundred now. Yeah, like six hundred. Six hundred. Uh, you said there's one more property. Um, uh, detect evil or good in a one foot radius, or you know, I mean, ten foot radius. One foot radius. Ooh, can you come closer to my sword? <laughs> <laughs> Whack. Yeah. So that's another hundred right there. So we're at about eight hundred. Mm-hmm. It has some drawbacks to it. Uh, maybe that will add more experience onto it. Maybe it'll take it away. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, uh, let's see here. Oh, going into our, the artifacts, the major ma- malevolent or minor malevolent effects. Let's say it's minor malevolent effect. Maybe possessor's hair turns white. How about that? Okay, so it's going to change. I would probably do another 100 experience points for that. That's no big deal. I would... I don't know. It sounds like probably a 1,000 experience point item. By the yeah. time we're all done with all the drawbacks and the risks of using it and the other properties. And considering yeah, like it's, a, it's an heirloom, that might increase the XP value. Yeah. By, by, by how much? We don't know. You know, who's to say? I would I, mean, I would just go through the DM guide and look through all the spells and see how much each spell is worth and break it down that way. I mean, obviously, it's a fireball spell, third level. No, sixth level, right? No, third level. Let me think. Third level. Yeah. Third level is fireball. 300 experience points. Obviously, it's not going to be the same exact thing as a fireball. So you want to look at it and say, well, we'll cut it in half, 150, because it has the fireball flame ability. Maybe you can, when you, you know... Um, when you take the sword and you chop, a piece of the fire flame goes flying out or something. So it does 1d6 points of damage. So you mm-hmm. get 150 experience points for that. Just look at the charts and look at the experience there and just yeah. kind of hack your way through it. Speaking of Hackmaster, hack your <laughs> way through it. Yeah. So what basically Vince and I are kind of getting around it here is the, is there's no real clear-cut way to do it. But, you know, we're giving you some ideas. And that's one of the beautiful things about the game is, you know, if you want to, you can kind of wing it on some things. There's no, there's no hard, clear cut way of doing it, no. and that's okay, as long as it's, as long as you're for the most part consistent and it makes sense in a game with fairies and dragons and orcs. Yeah, okay? as long as it makes sense, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. For sage advice, go to RFI staff at gmail.com. You can email us that, or you can give us a shout out at uh, 570 865 4210, the RFI hotline. Hot yes, where Nick is standing by to take your questions and never give you answers. What? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Stupid cold balls, I'm going to have to whip them into shape. And our last email comes from Psychic Love, and it says, You guys have won the jackpot. Yay. Thank you. <sighs> yes, thank you. Well, accept our check right now. Yeah, yeah. Here are your magic numbers. Yeah, okay, delete. I hate those emails. <laughs> I think we should head into table manners, and uh, that's the end of Sage Advice. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I'd like to find one with table manners. And what are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Okay, for uh, table manners this week, we're going to talk about uh, something that, I don't know, a lot of people just kind of 
overlooked because it's there's not a real big section of it in the DMG, but I kind of like it because it gives good background, in my opinion. And that's uh, secondary skills. Yes. And, uh, you know, what are they and how are they useful to, to your player characters? There's not a whole lot of it in, uh, about it, just like three paragraphs in a chart on page 12 of the DMG. And um, basically what it comes down to is you're creating a, a character and this is a way of maybe giving some background to that character if you want it. So it's kind of like the role play aspect of the character, adding a little more yeah. dimension to him instead of being just this one dimensional character, you can make him into like this two dimensional or three dimensional character with these backgrounds. So, oh, you roll up uh, uh fletching or something, or you roll up uh, uh sailboating or something or something, right. something like that. Well, then you can take that and, sit with your your DM and be like, well, uh, how about my guy was working on the docks and he liked, uh, he liked fishing. So, you know, maybe he, when it comes to like catching fish in the water, he knows it better than other people. So the DM might be like, oh yeah, okay, that's cool. If it ever comes to you guys catching food, fishing, you would have an advantage over everybody else. Right. That's one of the things I like about it. And that's what kind of, in a, in a nutshell, what that whole section, uh, really uh brings to light is you have a character and before they became you know joe the fighter (laughs) maybe this person was a sailor you know or a trapper furrier or were they a blacksmith or a blacksmith or a gambler you know just going through the going through the charts here going through the chart here and um Oh, yeah, gambler would be cool because then you'd have that compulsion to have yeah. your character want to gamble every time he's in town. And the DM can tease him with, oh, you see a good game of cards going on. It's like, ooh. Here's one, and here's the thing that I like most about this section here is when you roll up these secondary skills. And normally you just have one. But there's a chance that you may have a, a second skill. It yes. might be involved with your character. But the, the last paragraph was what, in my opinion, really hits home for this. When secondary skills are used, it is up to the DM to create and or educate situations in which these skills are used at, or useful to the player character. As a general rule, having a skill will give the character the ability to determine the general worth and soundness of an item, the ability to find food, make small repairs, or actually construct, uh, quote, crude items. For example, an individual with armor or skill could tell the quality of normal armor, repair chain links, or perhaps fashion certain weapons. To determine the extent of knowledge in question, simply assume the role of one of these skills, one that you know a little something about, and determine what could be done with this knowledge. Use this as a scale to weigh the relative ability of characters with secondary abilities. In other words, you don't have to roll anything. You just no. kind of go, you just kind of wing it a little and just be reasonable about it, you know? Yeah, if you want to just, if you have a cool DM, just pick something that interests you. Yeah, and as far as determining your knowledge, well, you know, it's really, uh, it's a, uh, between the player and the DM um, to come to agreement how much they would really know. And there's no rule needed. Just just say, okay, like for our Joe the Fighter who was a sailor in the past, uh, uh, maybe they uh, are the parties in a situation to where they have to um, <clears throat> excuse me, navigate down a river and there's some rapids ahead. Well, was Joe the sailor? Was he a freshwater or saltwater sailor? You know, did he go on lakes and river, or lakes and rivers, or was he mostly on the ocean and seas? I mean, those are those sorts of things. That he, and with his knowledge, would he still be able to, you know, navigate through those rapids? So you come to an agreement with that. And that's best, all you have to yeah. do. No rolling needed. Best bet is that if you just want to roll, roll fine. Take it whatever you get or just pick right on a piece of paper while everyone else is making up their characters. Jot down 10 things about it. 
So say yeah. you get blacksmithing, you know, jot down ten ideas of a, of a background of what your guy did before we come well, setting off for adventuring. You know, that's he, cool. That's a good idea. Because nine that, times out of ten, you give that to a DM and say, "Well, what do you think about these ideas? I can use as a background. Maybe it'll help my character be stand out." From nine times out of ten, the DM's going to be impressed with the fact that you took the time to do something with your character. He'll say, "Sure, just pick one." Mm-hmm. And then you have exactly. a background, and you have a cool skill that you don't, you know, that you need during the adventure. So, yeah. Or you got a guy who's. Who was a thief? I mean, what would be the perfect one for secondary skill? A gambler, <laughs> you know? Or yeah. maybe he was a uh, locksmith. A locksmith? Yeah. Uh, maybe, he, or, you know, thief could have been a sailor. Could have been a sailor, too. Yar. So, yeah, I think these skills not only help with like situations that might come in the future. And you look at your sheet. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. I was a, a uh, I was a jeweler in the past. I know how to uh, appraise that item. I could maybe figure out maybe the relative worth of that gem. Yeah, exactly. You come in a room that you find three gems. You're just like, oh, I remember. Isn't John? Wasn't he? Didn't he own that jewelry shop way back? That's right, yeah. John. What do you think? He, you know, takes a few minutes. To, the DM decides uh, what to tell him if he wants to make him make him a roll or not. You, at least he'd have a better chance than uh, Bob the Fighter. Yeah, yeah, it takes that, you know, vanilla, you know, whatever character that you made. It just gives a little bit extra background and a background that is useful that could come into play later on in the campaign. So I like these secondary skills. I I encourage people to to use them. You know, it's, lots of people forget about them. Yeah, a lot of people forget about it, and I it's a combination of a good role playing moment and it helps. With some, with some cooperation between the DM and the player, when certain situations arise where you have this skill, and then you just determine by talking out does the does the does the character have the knowledge to succeed? I think the, I think the problem is why people forget about it is because it's everything's scattered between the two books of how to build a character. That right. you, you're just like you just really want to play, and you're just like okay, 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 okay. And it's like, are I done? I'm like, can we play? Am I done? You know. And it's just by the time you get to it, it's just like a so for everybody, it's on page twelve of the DM's guide. <laughs> so just, yeah. just to put that out there. And so. Nick demands that you use it. Oh, I don't demand. Oh, I on. encourage. No, demand. Okay, I demand. Yeah. Uh, so tell us how you use secondary skills in your game. Do you use them? Do you make up your own? Do you just use the list? Or do you have an expanded list? Well, yeah. Do you have third day, uh, third editary skills? That'd be tertiary. I know. I was just making a joke. Third and airy. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> yep. Anyway, rfistaff at gmail.com. You think I'm mad. Perhaps I am. What are you, a wizard, a genius? Darn. A perfectly good brain wasted. Game mechanics. So we have game mechanics this week, as usual. Yes. And we're talking about level limits. Yes, yes. And people want to know why the level limits in the player's handbook are just like 11, 12. Why, why don't they go any higher? Yes, yes, yes. Because Gary decided, too bad, you can't go any higher. No. no. It's just that, I don't know. I don't know why he stopped at that certain level. I guess he figured that, you know, by the time you're adventuring at that level, it was what's the point? Well, what um, what character classes are you talking about? I know there are certain character classes where you can't really advance anymore in. Like, the one that comes to my to my mind actually right here is the assassin. Right. For, for like, there's um, on the assassins, you can only really advance up to level 15, if I recall. Or even better, um, the uh, uh, druid only goes so far. It seems like a lot. It's mostly the subclasses that have that seem to have level limits. Well, yeah. So, why should they really have level limits? I mean, like, what's stopping them from going further? I'm. The I'm not. I'm not so certain. Certain. There, I don't. Never understood the reason why they were level limits or why they were classes that stopped at certain levels. Well, or what's stopping you? The, or the other debate, 
where I are there level limits for uh, demi human characters. You know, yeah, what's, why can't... yeah, what's stopping uh, um, um, what do you call them? Uh, a halfling from going past level eight or something? Or I actually, I I know the answer for this. Please do tell. For, on on the on the demi human side, from what I understood, what Gary Gygax said is. The reason why there were level limits as far as demi-humans are concerned is, for the most part, D&D or AD&D is a humanocentric uh, world. Right. And he really wanted to, to to make human characters more appealing to play is that's why they're going to have unlimited levels. Because also demi-humans have other special abilities that humans do not. I guess the human special ability is they could go unlimited in levels in any class, while demi-humans cannot. But they have other things, I guess, that balance that out, like infravision, speaking multiple languages. Uh, if you're talking about dwarves, you know, detecting sloping passages, things of that nature. So that was a, an attempt at game balance as far as races are concerned. I also think is that it, most Is it people, a good explanation? No. No. That's that's debatable. Yeah. I don't think I've ever ran into a situation to where the special abilities of infravision and multiple language use uh of an elf, for example, have really outweighed me outweighed that versus playing a human. And, yeah. and, and level limits. I mean, that w- that was his rationale behind it, from what I understood. Yeah. But beyond that, I mean, how I personally see it, I I really don't. I, I don't yeah. see the point of it. I don't see the point of it either. I understand that's just the way he wrote it, but what's going to stop? What's stopping an actual character from saying, "I'm gonna well." Them advancing another level, but well, they just can't learn anymore. Is one of those their brains are full, or <sighs> maybe there's only so much knowledge about their particular uh, class or profession that they have learned. Maybe there's maybe they accumulate all the knowledge that they could about that particular class. Like I don't know, like looking at the monk a class, for example. If you're able to get all the way up to level seventeen as a be grandmaster of flowers and get all those of the special abilities and everything. Grandmaster what flowers. else is there that you can do? You already got the quivering paw. Yeah. You can kill people with a touch. <laughs> yeah. I, I, or what is it uh, for the druid? What levels that they can stop at? I mean, you're at the point where you could do like, was it elemental summoning elementals? <laughs> You know, I just control kind of, elementals. I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I think that the fact that, that Gary pretty much thought, well, most, most people get to ninth through tenth through eleventh level, they're just gonna kind of stop playing because they can pretty right. much defeat most of the stuff inside all the books. You know what? And I think that's a very good point, Vince. That our view of like levels then, as far as the game mechanics and how it works is a lot different than how levels are interpreted now with other games nowadays, especially when you're talking about, like, online gaming. I mean, when you hear about, I got a level 56 uh, Paladin for whatever game online. Wow. Yeah. In ADD, it's like what, a level, level ninth Paladin is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you I know. Mean, look at the the amount of experience points per level when you get up that high. Right, right. Granted, you're fighting things that are more powerful, but still, it takes such a long time. Exactly. What was it? Um, it usually, averages about. It was supposed to average when you get to the higher levels. When you get above like fifth, um, for the most part, I I would say it almost takes six months to a year to get to another level. Well, yeah, I know quite a few people that were uh, playing in campaigns for like 15, 20 years, and they were only still just barely in their teens. Yeah, as far as their levels are concerned. And that's playing like a week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. So I guess it's a matter of perspective versus, you know, you know, today 
how levels are used in games versus you know when AD and D came out, how levels were perceived and used. Now what about and, now what about that module, Nick, that you pointed out to me a while back about? Ah, uh, uh, yes, goes up to a hundred levels. About. Was it level eleven to one hundred? That would be Throne of Bloodstone. <laughs> That would be Throne of Bloodstone, and that goes from levels uh, 18 to 100. And um, I I never played the module. I remember a friend of mine when I was when I was a kid. He had a copy of it. And I remember seeing it. And I was like, "Is is this right? 18 to 100?" You know, I mean, is that right? I mean, that just didn't seem right. I mean, it just sounded weird to me that, you know, that's pretty wide range. <laughs> but I remember, yeah, it was, it's module H4, Throne of Bloodstone. It's set in Forgotten Realms in the Bloodstone lands. Yeah. Uh, obviously. And I, I've never seen it, but yeah, it's, it, there are, apparently there are rules in that uh, adventure where you can figure out, you know, how you could deal with characters that are right around a hundredth level. How you play them? I can't I think, imagine that. I think the adventure has to do with you have to get the wand of Orcus. <laughs> I remember someone writing to us way back, and they, were, I think they said they had like a level hundred something magic user and a level two hundred fighter or something. And they, right. they were, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, um, that's a lot to be. Uh... In AD and D, I don't think so. Um, well, maybe obviously, he, he like EverQuest, it. sure. <laughs> yeah, EverQuest. Jeez, Nick, that's an old game. Uh, I Sorry. think maybe he'll probably fudge some of the experience numbers there because everybody did that when they were younger. I mean, come on. Sure. Yeah. Who didn't go through the deities and demigods and start? Mm, I want to kill Thor and take his hammer. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Or who didn't try to like in, in classic D and D just like jump their characters up so they can go the immortal track? Sure, sure. But then that got old. Yeah, and then you started all over at level one again. Yeah, and it was fun again. But overall, yeah, as far as level limits, I, I really don't see the actual the actual point of them. But besides the rationale of saying, well, you've learned everything you could have learned in your particular profession slash class. And that's it. Does it mean you can't earn any more experience points? It's just, you're not learning anything else. If there's any special abilities are concerned with your character or class. Yeah. Now, on, and I told you the explanation as far as the, uh, the demi human side of things. So, right, right, right. I understand. But, you know, it's still, I just can't wrap my head around why they would be like, haha, level eight, that's it. Boom, done. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, well, let's hear some house rules and how people handle it in their games, because I'd be interested to hear that. I, I know- would like to hear a little bit about some, like, like these uber high level campaigns. You know, people have like 56 level paladins. I want to hear stuff like that and how crazy that is. <laughs> and someone that's played the module, how that went. Yes. I'd like to hear the people who played Throne of Bloodstone at all. You know, Nick, why don't you contact Blackstone and have him put that on his list to review? Throne of Bloodstone? Yeah. Well, let's see if I can get a copy for him. I don't know. They're hard to come by. We'll see. Well, you know, he could probably procure a uh, PDF of it somewhere. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Can't say. Anyway, let's end, let's let's end this segment and into creature feature theater. Creature, creature, feature, feature, theater, theater, theater. Creature feature theater this week. Uh, we go back to our old Stand By the Fiend folio, because yeah. it has such cool, interesting creatures in it. This one's a little weird. Yeah, this one... Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those you go, I see what they're going after, but wow. <laughs> what is it called? A Camadan? A Camadan. I would say a Camadan, yeah. Or a Camadan. Camadan. It's, yeah, page 55 of the Fiend folio. And this is like... you If the Displacer Beast wasn't freaky enough... 
Yeah. <laughs> this is like the Displacer Beast and a Salvador Dali take on the Displacer Beast. <laughs> <laughs> if And he was taking acid at the time. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you get yourself you get yourself a four plus two hit dice creature here in the form of a leopard with four to yes. seven snakes sprouting sprouting from its shoulders. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a wacky displacer beast combination. And the best part about this thing is he has all these attacks. And they'll do one to three hit points, one to six hit points for bites, and there's also uh some poisonous snake bites there for Are one they to four. Poisonous? Uh huh. Oh, they're not oh, poisonous. No, they're not. I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought it was poisonous. But the best part is he has a breath weapon, a cone of sleep. A cone of sleep. <laughs> and the best part, no savings are allowed. <laughs> wow. As long as you're as long as you fall under the hit dice. I mean if you go over it, obviously it doesn't affect you. But if you're fourth level or lower, guess what? <laughs> you're gonna take a nap. <laughs> So this creature is pretty weird looking. I mean, I could see this. I don't know. I kind of see this this creature as a Gamma World creature more than anything else. Yeah, like it was almost ported over from Gamma World in a way, doesn't it? Because it looks like a mutant freak creature. Yeah, that would be one setting. I know there are some people that um, do that sort of weird sword and sorcery kind of campaign setting, very Edgar Rice Burroughs or, um, uh, you know, if they really get into it, the you know, the Dying Earth, Jack Vance stuff. This would be one of those kind of creatures I think you would find in that kind of campaign setting, you know. Or if in my campaign setting, if I was, this would be something you would find in like the deep jungles or the lost continent kind of places. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just I look at this thing and I, t- I think total gamma world or like Thunder the Barbarian type monster, demon dogs. <laughs> yeah, demon Ariel, Ugla, ride. Uh, get the get. Let's kill that. Yes, I, don't know, I want that sun sword. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And actually, oh, wow, treasure type C. Mm-hmm. Really, where does it keep the treasure? Uh, well, <laughs> in his lair, because he's there 20% of the time. Oh. Pretty fast for the move, 18. Was a leopard. Yeah. The snakes I, are aerodynamic. Just to, be, just to be mean, I would actually make the snake bites poisonous. <laughs> why not? Yeah, why not? Why Jack couldn't up, there be a one with yeah. poisonous snake heads? Jack up the hit dice and make it a poisonous. Yeah, why not? Yeah, make it like a six or seven hit dice creature. Yeah, make all every bite a uh, chance to be poisonous. Yeah, That'd be maybe cool. not save or die, but no, uh, just, maybe additional like I don't know, additional D four damage for like a few rounds, you yep. know, something like that. Okay, or maybe it paralyzes, paralyzing uh, venom. So there we maybe go. There's some ideas. Save versus you have to save uh, versus poison or be paralyzed. I think the paralyzation would go rounds. perfect with the sleep cone. You know what I'm saying? The cone, is, the cone of sleep? Yeah, the paralyzation would go perfect with that. Oh, yeah, that would be. Yeah, I like that. Either you're going to get paralyzed or you're going to fall asleep. <laughs> or you're going to die. Yeah. Pretty cool. You're going to get got by this creature. Mm-hmm. Indeed. <laughs> but luckily, number pairing is one. So. <laughs> yes, if you see. Fairly too bad. If you see 20, run. <laughs> yeah. Remember, it's an exactly. old edition game. You can run. Yes, you can. You just have to be. You just have to be run faster than the next guy, which might be a dwarf. So you have yeah. an advantage. Run faster than the slowest guy in the party. Exactamundo. <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, tell I us. guess uh, we'll hear from anybody out there who's used this creature, or if you were going to use it, how would you use it? So let us know. Yeah. Stop by the forums or srgaming.org. Or RFI staff at gmail.com as we head into uh, the final segment of the night. Dragon's Horde. Roar. The Dragon's Horde. So we have a ring of telekinesis tonight. Telekowatsis? Telekowatsis? The telekowatsis power. Rubber yeah. spoon, rubber spoon, rubber spoon, rubber spoon. <laughs> Sorry, so, I was watching. I remember that one. 
Yeah. I Remember C Lab twenty twenty one? Yes, 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 yes. It's telekowatsis power. Telekowatsis power, spoon, yes. Rubber spoon, rubber spoon, rubber spoon. <laughs> I used to love that love that cartoon. Yes, it was great. Anywho. Uh yeah. <laughs> okay. First thing I think about when I see this thing is Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's strong in this one. The telekinesis is strong in that ring. Yes. It sounds kinda sick. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't know. I, I guess this item, the ability to give a player a telekinesis borders on the psionic thing, which I don't like, which most people are like, Ooh, what's Rowan psionics? Well, I don't like psionics because it reminds well, me of playing a Jedi. Well, the whole, well, let's read what the ring does here. Go so ahead. enables the wearer to telekinesis objects in the same manner as the fifth level magic user spell. The amount of weight can be moved, uh, however, is variable, and there's a chart you roll on, and the telekinesis takes one segment to uh, act. With that being said, there's the one little caveat to the problem that you did bring up, because, yeah, next thing you know, you got a guy dropping, you know, 1,000-pound things on people's heads and just <laughs> squashing them. You yeah, know, I might have to start game. assigning dark side points or something. I mean, come on. Well, here's the thing. If you notice, it has that little symbol next to it in the book, on yeah. page 131. Yeah. This is one of those rings where it could have a limited amount of charges, if so desired. These rings contain the most powerful magical abilities and may possess only a limited number of magical charges before being depleted at the DM's option. So... So we can give it, like, five charges. And that would be it, and then it just turns into lead. It turns into mud, and it rolls off your finger. Turns into a lodestone, and you can't lift your hand. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Too powerful for me, in my opinion. What about you, Nick? Really? Yeah. I think I think giving it limited charges does balance that out. I really do. So I would not have too much of a problem with it. If you only give it three charges, it only has three tries, and that's it. And the beauty of it is I wouldn't let the player know how many different charges, how many charges it had. Only I would know. Oh, I never tell players those things. Oh, okay. That's another discussion for another time. Yes, that's true. But I I mean, if it didn't have any limited amount of charges, oh yeah, this is this is something that, yeah, this is almost borders on cloak of displacement annoying. <laughs> yeah. In my book. <laughs> or like thinking about Gamers 2, the movie when he had the psychic energy blade. Oh, yes. The lightsaber. Oof. Yes, yes. It's a lightsaber. It's not even the right system. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a psychic energy blade. <laughs> but, yeah, there's not a whole lot to it. It's just, yeah, it can open up a whole bunch of problems for a DM. Now, for a player, Man. oh, this is a great thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I could lift 500 pounds without a problem, and I could drop it on people's heads and squash orcs and God knows what else. Hey, great. I could see a player trying to do that and, like, picking up an orc and smashing him to the ground and the fighter getting all confobbled and everything because he's trying to attack this orc that's going up and down, up and down. Yes. It's like, uh, and it doesn't say how long it lasts either, the, the, the telekinetic power. I would think once it's done, it's done. I would do the same basis. Well, what's the duration of it? Would it be based on the spell? I would base it on the spell, or I would base it on uh, how they would deal it when they used, actually, <laughs> no joke, the Jedi Force powers for telekinesis, how they have you make you, say you use a telekinesis and you lift him off the ground and start banging him up and down. For you to keep control of him, you'd have to make some type of concentration check. Mm. Some type of yeah, con- I guess I guess I would base it off the sp- the the magic user spell. How many rounds it would last, or just you do it that way. Yeah, it depends on how you want to do it as DM. You have your option of using it concentration, or you can go over the whole spell aspect of it and limit it that way. Yeah. So that's uh, the ring of telekinesis. I think it's too powerful, Nick. You think it's okay as long as it's adjusted? Yes, and limited as long as you as long as you have the uh, the charges. Involved with it, then, uh, yeah, the ring of telecoessence. <laughs> rubber spoon, rubber spoon, rubber spoon. Rubber spoon, yeah. Okay, so we're going to say, uh, let's end the last segment of the night. I actually said the goodbye for tonight. 
Goodbye. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I just had a couple final words. I forgot that I just want to do uh, talk about the uh, game that I ran at Gen Con. Because oh. I, I did run two games. Well, only one. The second game I actually had to bail out on because I got sick. So oh, I just wanted. Oh to yeah, you ate that pizza b- made by that Otiug. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to apologize to those people that actually did show up for the game. And uh, I do apologize for not being able to attend, but I had to stay close to the hotel room. Yeah. And the first game, it was sold out, but only four people showed up. So why would someone buy something for a game and not show up? I've done that. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Because I get sidetracked. <laughs> granted, it's like four, whatever, five, six dollars for the game, but still, I mean. Yeah, I've done that. Something comes up, you're like, you meet a whole bunch of people, that, and you're like, oh, I haven't seen you like forever. Are you want to go out? Oh, well, oh, I got a game going on then. Ah, I could miss it. <laughs> well, this the, the adventure that I did run off went really well, and uh, I wrote up uh, a party of characters, and the, half the party wound up keeping their characters because they thought it was a cool idea because I wrote it by hand on a piece of paper uh-huh. as opposed to using a character sheet, and they thought that was really cool, the old school touch. Uh, the first... Sweet. Yeah, the first adventure was kind of like a sci-fi-ish type thing for D&D. They had oh. to investigate this meteor that crashed in the mountains. And uh, it was... Kill- uh, Expedition to Barry Peaks kind of way, huh? Yeah. And uh, it was killing off the crops and animals were going uh, missing. And the mayor of the town pretty much wanted them to go investigate and just figure out what's going on or get rid of what's going on. So the players wound up going in there and they found out that it was an alien... Well, I can tell you out of character, it's an, an, out of, an alien ship that crash landed into the side of the mountain. And ah. what basically there were orcs that were feeding the aliens food. And the aliens were laying eggs, and the little babies were going out munching on the little, uh, like the corn and the animals out there and everything. So that's what that was. But the players wound up getting rid of the flying saucer. End the town all in one shot. Nice. Yeah. Way to break it. Way to break an adventure. Yeah. They want to blow. Never saw that one coming, did you? No. I didn't <laughs> think they would actually do what they did. They actually tried to get this thing to move off the mountain, so they wound up blowing up the thing and getting out before it blew up. As the thing went down off the side of the mountain and blew up and in the village, the town. yeah, and destroyed the town <laughs> and the mountain, but they actually. The whole party survived the blast. Yes, yeah, so I could say, oh, we finally made it out. Yeah, they're like, we go back to town. I go, what town? And they're like, uh, you mean there used to be a town here? I'm like, yep. And then one of the guys like, okay, let's go to the next town. Then. <laughs> and not mention this ever again. <laughs> we know nothing about this. They were actually pretty impressed with themselves. We're actually destroying the threat and the town in one shot. I like these guys already. Yeah. You sure these guys weren't from like Northeast Ohio? And I don't know where they were from. Uh, I think a couple people listened to the show, and uh, another guy was just there because he wanted to play classic, and they enjoyed themselves. I, I hope. Good. They said they had fun, and uh, so. Oh, speaking of games, just quick. Uh, speaking of games, yeah, I got my game? campaign going on this weekend. Yeah. Temple Elemental Evil, or as existential evil. And uh, sounds this week they're going to be going into the temple. Yeah, so they're finally going to get there. So should be interesting. It'll be a good, good way to to uh, you know my send off for my friend Jeff for he uh, heads to Afghanistan. So be really really cool. Yes, and I'm reopening up my Thursday night games. So ah, yep. We should be doing the Book of Sorrows. Uh, part um, two now, or no, it's three, because the first was the search, then it was destruction, now it's the keep away game. Ah, now I just hear a whole bunch of people out there in RFI land saying, yay, Book of Sorrows! A lot of people actually keep asking me about it, and the players players finally just decided, let's do it, let's do it. Cool, yeah, a lot of people were wanting to hear more of those. So hell, I'll go on with it, yeah. Oh, and... uh, some late breaking news. I have figured out a way to make a official DM screen, hopefully within reasonable price for everybody. We'll keep you people posted and see how it goes. Yeah, I've got the preliminary artwork done officially. 
I just have to put it the layout together and hand it into the uh, gentleman who'll be producing it. He's going to give me a prototype. I'll take some pictures and put it up on my blog and the website. Uh, we're talking probably about two weeks before we get a prototype. So, cool. But uh, as soon as we get it together, we'll we'll have Nick will have his. I'll have mine, and we'll take some orders for it for you guys who really desperately want a new screen. It'll be wicked cool. So uh, I guess that's going to end the show. Okay. Keep original, keep old school, and good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Roll for initiative.